Okay, welcome back. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, if you joined me the last time, you heard me talking about the uh, early days of the George W. Bush presidency, and you heard me talk about how uh, the, the September 11th attacks in New York and Washington are really going to transform his presidency, it's going to make him into a wartime president. And uh, really the first order of business for the remainder of his two terms as president is going to be um, defending the homeland, making sure that we're safe. One of the things that that led to is what Bush called the War on Terror. What he meant was, we're going to be very, very stern with countries that we know either harbor terrorists, um, um, allow terrorists to use the country for training or re recruiting purposes, or sponsor uh, state terrorism, right? It becomes pretty clearly, or pretty clear, very quickly after this uh, attack that it's Afghanistan and its ruling party, the Taliban, that is um, that is offering uh, refuge to Osama bin Laden's terrorist network of Al Qaeda. And what we demanded was that the Taliban hand over bin Laden so that he could be tried for the murder of American citizens. And the Taliban said that they wanted to negotiate. We said we would refuse to negotiate. And so in, instead, we started dropping bombs on Afghanistan. Now, the good part about this is we're able to topple the Taliban government, right? Send them into exile. A brutally repressive regime that, like I've just got done saying, sponsored uh, state terrorism. The downside is, what do you do with Afghanistan now that the Taliban's gone? You need to rebuild it. Now, we knew what we wanted to do with this. We wanted to transform Afghanistan into a democracy, the same way that we had transformed Greece and Turkey, Germany, uh, Italy, France, into democracies in the aftermath of World War II, right? The only problem is, um, Italy is quite, quite different than Afghanistan. Um, it's a very different culture than the West, and uh, people in Afghanistan don't entirely understand what you mean when you say democracy, right? And so rebuilding Middle Eastern countries, including Afghanistan, is going to be easier said than done, considering there's not a lot of democratic context in that part of the world, right? You'll see what I mean here in just a few minutes. But for right now, I want you to understand that the war on terror has domestic consequences as well. In the aftermath of the attack, there are uh, families of victims that demanded that the federal government do an investigation to find out why we were so ill-prepared to stand up to an attack like this. And ultimately, what we decided was wrong was the country was not properly structured to, 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 to withstand an attack like this, especially when you consider security. And so to that end, to really shore up the security breach, what we're going to do is we're going to pass something called the USA Patriot Act. And what this is going to do in short order is it's going to give the federal government a lot more monitoring capability to keep an eye on what American citizens are doing, to some, in some cases listening in on what American citizens are doing. Um, the good side of this, I guess we can say that we're better able to protect uh, people against the bad guys, right? Uh, I think that that's uh, something that can be said for that. The obvious downside is this is a shrinking of civil rights and civil liberties. You don't have to be a constitutional lawyer to understand that um, more government monitoring capabilities means less privacy, potentially less access to First Amendment rights, uh, freedom of press, freedom of speech, things of that variety. And so this war on terror, similar to the Cold War, is going to have a domestic politics uh, component to it. And this is really going to be instrumental in defining American politics for the next several years. For right now, I want to go back to foreign policy, because that's really where all the marbles are. A lot of individuals within the Bush administration are looking at the scenario in the Middle East and say, why just stop in Afghanistan, right? Not only are there other troubled countries throughout the region, but no president in recent memory has really had a whole lot of success in brokering lasting peace, right? Um, that could change with the Bush administration. Now keep in mind, I said this before, but it bears repeating, right? Bush is going to make up his administration with a lot of Reagan, George H.W. Bush holdovers. Um, we talked about how Dick Cheney was a neoconservative. He was not exactly a compassionate conservative. 
and he's going to approach governing much, much different than how George Bush portrayed himself on the campaign trail in 2000. Another individual that's worth noting is Donald Rumsfeld, who's going to go on to become George W. Bush's Secretary of Defense. Together with Cheney, what they're going to look for is a way to remake the Middle East in a democratic format, right? To replace these brutal regimes with democratically elected leaders that, that are going to stabilize the region and, and, and offer a better chance of lasting peace. Let me come back to that in just a second. None of that would have been possible without something called the Bush Doctrine. This is a terribly important idea. It's coming out of George Bush's first term as president. And what it is espousing is that America has the right to defend itself. And everybody says, of course, we have the right to defend ourselves. But it went a step further. It said, we have a right to defend ourselves even if the country that we're worried about has not already attacked us. I mean, it's one thing to declare war on Japan after they bombed us at Pearl Harbor. What this would have done is essentially given the United States the right to bomb Japan even before the bombing of Pearl Harbor. It's a preemptive strike in that capacity. It's a way of knocking out a threat before that threat even is a threat, right? And so this Bush doctrine is going to dovetail with his 2003 um, State of the Union address. And in that address, Bush is going to outline three countries that he calls the axis of evil. He talks about Iran and how Iran is led by brutal authoritarian political regimes and how they sponsor terrorism. And clearly they're, uh, they're part of this axis of evil. Also talks about our age old enemy in the region, Iraq, right? Um, Saddam Hussein was the leader of Iraq. We knew that he was a brutal, terrible leader. We knew that he used biological and chemical weapons on his own people. So clearly, if he ever got his hands on a weapon of mass destruction, he's not going to be reluctant to use them. Lastly, North Korea, led by a totalitarian regime, brutal track record of human rights violations. Collectively, these three countries are going to make up the axis of evil. But it's really Iraq that we're worried about, right? And to that end, what George Bush pointed out is we're worried that Saddam Hussein is, is in the process, possibly even very close to developing a weapon of mass destruction. And so in the aftermath of this speech, what he's going to do is demand that weapons inspectors are going to be allowed into Iraq to make sure that he's not, not up to no good. Initially, Saddam Hussein comes along with this requirement, right? But eventually he's going to throw out the weapons inspectors. And in that's going to give George Bush the political capital that he needs to unleash what is going to come to be known as shock and awe, right? Now, he's going to basically cite the Bush doctrine. Saddam Hussein represents a threat. And before we see that threat manifest itself as a mushroom cloud, right, use of weapon of mass destruction, we need to neutralize that threat, now, shock and awe, if you're looking at the PowerPoint slide there, it's at the top of the screen there. That was the brainchild of people like Donald Rumsfeld. And it basically, it's hit your enemy so hard and so quickly that they barely even know what's going on before it's already too late. In short, we're going to knock out Saddam very, very quickly. We're going to send him into exile. Later on, we'll find him hiding in a hole in the ground and uh, put him on trial, crimes against humanity, and he'll be executed. Knocking out Saddam was never really the big challenge. The big challenge was, what do you do with Iraq once you have it? What the government either didn't know or conveniently forgot to tell the American people was that there were many different groups that did not like each other at all in Iraq, right? That would tear each other to ribbons if given even half of an opportunity. And, and although he was a brutal, brutal dictator, what was keeping Iraq stable was Saddam Hussein. In short, what we need to be worried about, but we don't really understand this yet, we need to be worried about this, this death fight for power. There's a power vacuum, and, and that vacuum was created when Saddam Hussein went away. And now you've got all of these competing factions that are, that are desperately trying to become the number one force in Iraq for political purposes. What happens is we, at least initially, are greeted as liberators, 
and they're very, very happy that uh, we've taken out Saddam for them. And then they tell us to go home. And we said, well, we can't go home yet. We've got to give you democracy. They said, uh, we don't know what that is, and we're pretty sure we'd hate it even if we did. And so go home. And we said, no. And by remaining in Iraq, we came across as an occupying force. We look like an occupation. And if you know anything about the history of the Middle East and its antagonism, the conflict between the West, you'll know that any occupation of a Middle Eastern country by a non-Muslim group is going to be seen as deeply and profoundly controversial. Long story short, what we're going to do in Iraq is give rise to an insurgency. Suicide bombers, roadside bombs, um, it, it's not going to be a problem knocking out Saddam. It's going to be staying in Iraq in the aftermath that becomes such a big, big challenge. And if you're George Bush, these mounting casualties, they're a problem. War is bad for business, right? And what was even worse is the guy that they thought that they were going to run against in uh, 2004, he goes down to defeat in the primaries. And it's going to be John Kerry, a senator from Massachusetts, that will become the Democratic nominee. Now, a couple of things about Kerry. Number one, if you're Bush, you don't want to run against this guy. Primary reason is this guy is, is a walking encyclopedia when it comes to foreign policy expertise. Reason why, in his long storied history as a senator, he had served on dozens of foreign policy committees. That's not good news, especially if this is a referendum about Iraq and, and a mistake potentially going into Iraq. I mean, that's not a good deal. The worst deal is that Kerry was also a Vietnam veteran, a highly decorated Vietnam veteran. And, you know, it's one thing to run against a senator. It's another thing to run against a war hero. Um, he had not only served in Vietnam, been wounded in Vietnam, but he had volunteered his services. It's not like he had to wait around to get drafted. So when you don't have a whole lot to run on, basically the only thing that you can do is change the conversation. And that's exactly what Karl Rove and George Bush are going to do. They are going to unleash a series of TV ads entitled The Swift Boat Veterans for Truth. And what these guys are is they're Vietnam veterans like Kerry, and they begin to call into question his service and his record in Vietnam. Um, I don't know what John Kerry's talking about because I served right there alongside him, and I don't remember anything like that happening. Casting a little bit of doubt on Kerry in terms of how much can you trust this guy. Um, the other thing that they do is talk about how un-American, how anti-patriotic he was um, when he came back home and had the audacity to criticize the war effort in Vietnam. Right? The other thing that the Bush team is going to do to really change this conversation is bring up some social issues that were on the ballot in very important swing states like Ohio and Florida in 2004. Issues that involve stem cell research. Should we legalize the harvesting of human tissues to allow doctors and scientists to uh, develop cures or at least help them develop cures for uh, things like Alzheimer's disease or uh, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, things of that variety? Same-sex marriage. Should we make it uh, legal for two, um, uh, two people of the same sex to marry each other in these states? And lastly, um, uh, it was very well known that Kerry was uh, from Massachusetts. It was also very well known that Kerry didn't have a whole lot in common with the rural part of the country. And so people on the political right began squawking that if Kerry wins this election, he's going to come after your guns. This is why a lot of historians call this an election about gays, guns, and God, right? These were social issues that they're on the ballot. And what's going to happen are religious conservative voters, the religious right, is going to turn out in, in droves. And in the end, when they're there, they're going to say, well, what the hey, I might as well vote for the conservative at the top of the ticket. And we think that that's a very important reason why George Bush won a second term as president, right? He wins. This time he wins in both the... Uh, electoral college as well as the popular vote he wins by a majority but it's really here that his problems begin okay problem number one is the casualties aren't going away in Iraq Iraq is not going good at all right if anything it's becoming worse and worse 2005 is probably the the, the low point of the of, of, of the war right and worst of all it doesn't seem like too many people in Washington have a whole lot of answers as far as what to do next What's worse is you've got scandals at home. For all their tough talk on defending the homeland, 
It's the Bush administration that wants to sell port space. Space in cities like New York and Los Angeles where stuff comes in, people comes in, wants to sell some of those spaces to a Dubai country that uh, had, we knew, sponsored terrorism in some form or fashion. That didn't exactly square with the message on the campaign trail, and that's the problem, right? Big, big problem's gonna come with his failed attempt to privatize Social Security. This had long been a conservative dream to, to hand over this government-ran pension program to private investment firms, predominantly on Wall Street. The only problem is there's a lot of risk with that, right? If Wall Street is now running what used to be Social Security, you retire at a certain age and collect a check for the rest of your life, you paid into it your entire life, it could go one of two ways. It could go really, really good if the market goes up and your retirement can go along with it. Or if the market completely falters, your retirement falters with it. There was a reason why Ronald Reagan didn't dare touch Social Security, right? And the reason was it was a political loser. And George Bush goes in front of the American people and says, listen, the time has come to really modernize Social Security, and I'd like to privatize it to the point where Wall Street has access to these Social Security funds. And the people that swarm to the, to, to the ballot boxes in 2006, those are elderly people, people that just so happen to be on Social Security. As a matter of fact, this failed attempt to privatize Social Security was a very key component in the Democrats taking back uh, the House of Representatives. The Democrats, for the first time in a while, are going to have a majority in the House. And not only that, what should have been really, really concerning for the Bush administration is they're also going to take the Senate, right? Not by much, but they will take it in states like North Carolina, Missouri, Montana. Those aren't exactly coastal liberal states. Um, that ought to be a pretty significant, pretty scary warning sign. But at least it can't get any worse. Until it got worse. In September 2005, a Category 5 hurricane named Hurricane Katrina hit the Gulf City of New Orleans, right? This was catastrophic for a number of reasons, but New Orleans was below sea level. And so you better have a very good um, system to keep the water out and keep the city from flooding because it's a problem if you don't. The organization that has designed the levee system, the dam system in uh, New Orleans is the Army Corps of Engineers. Now it's the federal government. And those levees do not hold up. And when they break, the city of New Orleans floods. This is a big, big problem. And although everybody had told people in New Orleans, you better get out of here, the, the floods are going to come, it's, it's real difficult. It's a huge, huge challenge to evacuate an entire American city. Worse, you've got a humanitarian crisis going on down there. You've got people that are dying in their homes, either from flooding waters or, you know, heat stroke. It's New Orleans, it's September. Uh, they're in their attics. Do the math, right? The guy that's in charge of the Federal Emergency Relief Agency, FEMA, that would be a guy by the name of Michael Brown. And Michael Brown did not have an awful lot in his resume that would lead you to believe, here's a guy that should probably be in charge of this emergency relief organization if we should ever have a national emergency like Hurricane Katrina. It took George Bush a little while to get down to New Orleans, but when he finally does tour the wreckage, he looks over there at uh, Michael Brown, who's um, at this press conference with him, and he says, Brownie, you're doing a hell of a job. I mean, this was a huge slap in the face to people that uh, were, were suffering, like legitimate forms of suffering in New Orleans. And we also believe that Hurricane Katrina was a very instrumental part as to why the Bush administration began uh, the second term on such a bumpy road and the Democrats were able to retake Congress. But it can't get any worse. Until it got worse. In 2008, the economy crashed. No? Now, let me say something about this before we go any further. Uh, I said this when we were talking about the Great Depression. When the economy is good, the president gets too much credit. And when it's bad, the president gets too much blame. It was not George Bush's decision to completely deregulate Wall Street. Um, those decisions have been made by prior presidents, some of whom were Democrats, some of whom were Republicans, plenty of blame to go around there. But what I will say is as his time as president, Bush didn't do an awful lot to kind of shore up that lack of regulation. 
bottom line is Wall Street was investing in some pretty risky adventures um, during this period, right? Uh, they had been given a lot more discretionary ability, wiggle room ability, to go ahead and make loans to people that probably had no business having loans made to them. And what we call this is the 2008 housing crisis, right? There's a bubble that's uh, beginning to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Real estate, you'll never go wrong in real estate. You need to invest in real estate, right? The only problem is the reason that real estate is a good investment is that it does generally tend to appreciate in value. As soon as it doesn't appreciate in value, that's when you're in trouble, right? And when this housing market burst and housing values began to depreciate, that's when Wall Street is basically overextended. One of the first firms to really go belly up and demonstrate the massive problem that is, um, that, that, that is the, the, the Great Recession was a financial institution named Bear Stearns that was a very old institution and traced its roots all the way back to the uh, Gilded Age. It is insolvent. It owes more than what it's worth and it goes bankrupt. That should have been a huge warning sign. The insurance group, the American International Group, AIG, is telling Congress that it too is horribly overextended. It is on the brink of bankruptcy. Lehman Brothers is saying the same thing. We're overextended. We very well could go broke. Um, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, these are, these are government lending agencies, and they too are telling Congress we're an eyelash away from, from going under. What Congress tells the American people, these financial organizations, they're too big to fail. If they go down, what's coming down with them is the rest of the American economy. It's going to be like a second Great Depression, only this time I'm not so sure that we get back up off the mat. These firms are too big to fail. If Lehman Brothers goes down, then what's to say that Bank of America is not next? And if B of A goes down, Citigroup is next. Morgan Stanley is next. That's the message that's being conveyed. And the message that's also being conveyed is we need to bail out Wall Street. We need, as, as, as taxpayers, we need to clean up their mess. We may need to get them back up to solvency. We need to make sure that they have enough money to survive. And when the American people got word of this, there was a massive outpouring in the streets to allow Wall Street to go broke. This was the, the, the massive protest in 2008, the fall of 2008, that's saying Wall Street made this mess let Wall Street clean it up. People calling their senators, people calling their congressmen, and telling them to vote no on the Wall Street bailout, right? Um, in addition to being very, very embarrassing um, to, to, to uh, the, the political establishment, this is also going to really do two things. Number one, it's going to really make it likely that you're going to see a Democrat in the White House in 2008, right? And the second thing that it's going to do is it's really going to end those boom times of the 1990s. Um, it's really going to usher in some, some, some very troubling economic times that's going to take several years to, to dig out of, right? But 2008 is an election year. And the individual that we thought was going to be the Democratic nominee turned out not to be that nominee. Early on in 2008, it was not a secret that Hillary Clinton had ambitions to run for the presidency. Former First Lady, now U.S. Senator, um, tons of experience when it comes to that capacity. Her big problem is that she voted to allow the Bush administration to go into Iraq. And that was a decision that she never really kind of came to terms for, right? Now, her primary opponent in this, um, in this process to become the nominee of the Democratic Party is the guy that you're looking at at both the top and the bottom of the screens there, a, uh, um, uh, a senator from Illinois by the name of Barack Obama. Now, at the time that the decision on the Iraq war was made, he was a congressman, and he made it very clear that he was against the war. And when he was on the campaign trail trying to become the Democratic nominee, he makes it very clear, she voted to go to war, and I did not. And I'm very glad that I was against this from the onset, right? Long story short, Barack Obama is your peace candidate. 
And even after he had gotten the nomination, he campaigned on the idea that Iraq was a mistake and that if he were elected president, he would get us out of Iraq, right? This is one of the things that he promised to do um, as president. Barack Obama is going to run on not only an anti-war campaign, right, or a platform, he's also going to run on a pro-middle class platform. It was not lost on the American people that Barack Obama really kind of started out as a community organizer in South Chicago. When the steel plants packed up, when the meatpacking jobs went away, it was Barack Obama that was coming in and instructing uh, those Chicagoans as to what they could do when it comes to making sure that their government mobilized and was responding to the situation, right? And so he's seen as an economic populist at the same time as he's seen as a force in the anti-war movement, all right? The guy that's running on the Republican ticket is a very well-respected senator from Arizona, a guy by the name of John McCain. John McCain um, was a war hero. He was a Vietnam veteran. As a matter of fact, he had spent uh, months and months in a Vietnamese prison camp. Um, he was a hero. And he was also a Republican with a long track record of being sort of like an outsider. He used to call himself a maverick. He didn't always go along with the status quo, and as a matter of fact, uh, we didn't get a chance to talk about this, but it was McCain that was running against George W. Bush uh, in the primary season for the election of 2000. He had actually opposed George Bush and tried to get the nomination in that year. So that's kind of dovetails with this idea that he's, he's his own man in that capacity. Problem is, Bush's economy... Um, isn't very good. Um, you understand that, that the economy is bad and the American people blame the party in charge. No, Bush isn't running, but basically a lot of people are blaming him for the economic downturn. And it's also very clearly George Bush's war, right? And so this is a lot of political baggage and what he needs is a game changer. He thinks that he found one in his vice presidential selection, uh, governor of the state of Alaska, a lady by the name of Sarah Palin, okay? Sarah Palin was seen as a game changer primarily because so many American women, so many Americans generally speaking, voted for Hillary Clinton. The idea being if people were, you know, in the mood for a woman in the, um, in the White House, and, you know, all that being said, the vice president, right, then maybe Sarah Palin would be a good selection. Here's the problem with Sarah Palin. She's governor of a state where nobody really lives and doesn't have very much at all in common with the lower 48 states. Yeah, you are a, a governor, and yeah, Alaska is an important state, but it doesn't have very much in common with the American people, right? So that's a problem, but it also means that she doesn't have an awful lot of experience on some other really important issues issues that involve foreign policy, and we're knee-deep in Iraq. This is a problem, right? And it was only so long that they could hold out before the press basically was able to have access to her. And through a series of gaffes and just plain old missteps, she doesn't do John McCain an awful lot of favors. I'm not saying that she lost him the election, but I'm saying that she did not do him a lot of favors when it comes to moving the Republicans in the direction of victory. If you look at that map, Barack Obama is going to win this thing big time. Um, the, you also see some pretty red states that are going to turn blue this time around. Look at North Carolina. Look at Indiana. Those are those are very deep red states, and, and they're going to go for Obama in 2008. And I remember this election because I remember political commentators saying that uh, we very well might be looking at the uh, next Franklin Roosevelt, the next New Deal coalition. Um, what they're saying is that the Democratic Party appears to be becoming the dominant party in American politics, and then this happened, right? What I'm talking about would be the midterm elections in 2010, and if you're looking at that map, that's a very deep shade of red, right? The Republicans are going to take back the House of Representatives, and when they do, they're going to really put a roadblock to many things that the Obama administration had hoped to get done, probably most importantly, health care reform, okay? There is an awakening of the politi American political consciousness on the right, and that awakening is called the Tea Party, right? Standing for taxed enough already, what the Tea Party began as was a group of Americans that had lost their jobs, many of them had lost their homes in the Great Recession, 
And they began to be very critical in a very public manner of Washington and the way that it spent money. They were tired of seeing government tax them only to send their money to corporations that uh, made a big mess on Wall Street. And then the American taxpayer runs in at the last minute and saves the day. It's important that you understand that the Tea Party was an independent political movement, similar to the populist movement in the 1890s. But it's also fair to say that in 2010, you see an enormous amount of corporate money being poured into the Tea Party, and the Republican Party is basically going to absorb the Tea Party, very similar to what happened to the populist and the Democratic Party in 1896, right? But if you've ever heard the expression Tea Party Republican, we mean somebody like Sarah Palin at the bottom of the screen there. We also need, mean people like the senator from uh, the state of Texas, Ted Cruz, um, had historically described himself as a Tea Party Republican. That's what I mean, this economic populism, don't tax me to only to, to send it to the rich and powerful already, um, that's unconstitutional and that's not right. That's, that's the political awakening that I want you to be mindful of when it comes to the right. You also see a political awakening on the left as well. And this political awakening is going to manifest itself through a Supreme Court decision entitled Citizens United. Now, for your notes, what Citizens United is going to do is it's going to define corporations as people. And because they are people, they have rights. Um, think about this for a second. McDonald's is a corporation, and now McDonald's is a, a person. How does McDonald's express itself politically? According to the Supreme Court, what it does is it spends money. It sponsors political candidates. It sponsors as many political candidates as it would like. And ultimately, over the course of time, what this is going to demonstrate is that there's an enormous amount of money being poured into American politics. And people like the senator from Vermont, Bernie Sanders, is going to make this very clear. The problem, Citizens United, passed in 2010, is going to poison the well of democracy. It's really going to be a game changer by allowing corporations who are flush with cash to basically pick and choose what political um, you know, officers that they want to run various elements of the country. In short, this has the potential to take us all the way back to the Gilded Age, when you had Andrew Carnegie and John Rockefeller and Cornelius Vanderbilt that pretty much ran the country. And not all, but many other chunks of the American population lived at or below the poverty level. The whole issue of Citizens United is going to give rise to what we call the Occupy Wall Street movement. In occupying Wall Street, what these protesters were trying to do was make it difficult for these Wall Street CEOs, CFOs, to get back and forth to work. Um, bring attention to the crisis that they themselves helped to create and make it be known that the American people had their eye on them, right? Um, this is the political awakening that I need you to be mindful of on, on, the, on the left. And so that begs the question, what does it all mean, right? Um, there are times that you'll turn on the news and you'll, you'll hear some commentator talk about, you know, a political crisis, right? I think that we use that expression a little bit more than we need to use it in this day and age. But it's also fair to say that we have seen some pretty significant issues, whether we're talking about Great Recession, whether we're talking about money and politics, we've seen some pretty significant political crises in our past. And it begs the question, are we freer? Um, in ways, yes, and in ways, no. But there's one thing that we still have that I think is really instrumental in terms of um, preserving freedom in American society. And that's our question, that, that's, that's our ability to ask the question, why? Why are things the way that they are? Uh, why, why do you have freedom for some groups and not freedom for everybody else? Why does government spend money in the way that it does? As long as we preserve that institution of the, being the, ability, the ability to ask the question why, um, I think that we can avoid these political crises. I want to end this lecture with this individual. Now, that is an individual that you, many of you may know, especially if you like to read. That's George Orwell, who wrote this really important book, um, called 1984. Other books as well, but in any case, 1984. And George Orwell was once quoted um, in saying that he who controls the past, uh, and I'm paraphrasing him now, but ultimately controls the society, right? History is a really important topic, right? 
It is, and it's not just because you're talking to a historian. Of course I believe that. Um, it's a very important topic because it's important to understand how we got to this point. It's also important to understand if, if you want to move forward, right? If you want to move forward and you want to get past some of these uh, struggles, these traditional roadblocks, it's important to understand that where we came from. History is very, very powerful. And uh, in a day and age where you have um, individuals and organizations that are trying to radically alter uh, the way that American history is being taught, it makes it all the more important than ever to, to have a very firm understanding of where we came from as a nation. So that's where I'm going to leave it for this lecture, guys. Um, I'm hopeful that this has been a good experience, and I'll see you later.